Welcome to tonight's London Luminaries Lectures, 14 historic properties working together collaboratively to share our collective history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm the host for this event. Please do ask lots of questions from our speakers and this will be recorded, but you won't be visible. But it is my great delight as the host to be able to introduce you to our fantastic chair this evening. And that, of course, is the wonderful Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Welcome to those of you who are watching us live and also welcome if you're catching up with us later on YouTube. I just want to say at the start that I'm particularly grateful today to everybody who's worked behind the scenes to get this show on the road. Um, I want to uh, just say a little word about how lovely it's been working with the luminaries. Rachel mentioned that we're a voluntary organisation of 14 properties, mostly in the southwest of London, and we do a lot of mutual support. Mostly we, we band together to run these talks to make a con connection with you, our lovely audience, and all of the proceeds from the ticket sales are shared equally between the 14 organisations, but it has been really fascinating to find out what kinds of connections there are between these different properties, and if you listen to more than one talk, you might find that similar themes or even sometimes the same personnel crop up in different locations. I'm also particularly delighted to introduce tonight's speaker Val Bott who has spoken for us before on other subjects but she is a very experienced and knowledgeable speaker. She is a founder member of the Friends of Gunnersbury Park and she has been fighting to preserve the park and ensure its future as a community asset since 1981. With her husband, she has published an excellent short history of the site for visitors, visitors to this unique location. Over to you, Val. Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do before I tell you the story. Um, but the work that my husband, James Wisdom, and I have done over many years of collecting information about Gunnersbury has shown us that it has been through a series of transformations and the next slide shows you a, just a quick summary of the transformations. We know a little about it being farmland in the very early days until it became a Palladian estate with formal gardens in the middle of the 17th century. That Palladian estate was softened with new landscaping and a new wall garden in the middle of the 18th century, and then became a royal estate for the rest of that century. In 1800, it was rather sadly divided into 13 plots, but only two new villas were built with fine gardens. And after the Rothschilds bought the biggest of those two, they were able to buy the second one and reunite the estate in the 19th century. From the 1920s, Gunnersbury has been a public park. And in the last decade or so, uh, about 40 million has been spent, 20 million on the historic parts and the new museum. and the remainder on sports facilities. So it's a very big change at Gunnersbury in recent years. I'm going to be looking at a thread through all of those changes that relates to food and drink. One of the wonderful things in the museum collection is a set of fabulous, slightly honey-coloured watercolours by William Payne. And this is the first of them that I'll show you tonight. This is a view looking from the south and you can see the Palladian house high on the hill trees in front of it are the parkland and then in front of that um, the beginning of the the farming estate horses in the distance and a gateway that led from the lane into um, the farming estate um, we will look next at roke's depiction of the landscape which is very different this is the wonderful detailed survey of london and environs from the 1740s this is almost a century on from the Palladian estate, but before the softening of the landscape. And this just gives you the bearings in West London as it is now, Middlesex then. At the bottom of the crop from the map, you can see the Thames and uh, the words Kew Ferry, um, where later Kew Bridge was built. That was the foot ferry and further west was a, a horse ferry that took vehicles so the royal family could uh, actually come across on their on their horse horses or in, in, in a carriage. Gunnersbury's estate is right in the centre 
of the, the map, as we've shown here. And then around it, you can see Roke has put a whole series of fields, most of which are arable. His, his code for ploughed fields is dotted lines. And there are all the there are all the fields around, rich farmland. And what you can't really see is, is that this is the rising ground that appeared in the watercolour. Now, the first detailed description of the estate that we have um, comes up in um, the 1370s. Alice Perez, Edward III's uh, mistress, um, was pretty well hated. She was ambitious and she managed to corner an enormous amount of property from her relationship with the king. Um, but after she was reinstated, it was valued by a panel of jurors. And these are summaries from the description in 1376 of, of um, the value of the estate at Gunnersbury. 228 acres, 30 acres sown with corn, 80 acres of pasture. Enormous difference in the valuation there. Two shillings an acre for the corn, 13 shillings for 80 acres of pasture. What wheat and rye had been sown and was growing at the time she got the estate back but it was in very poor condition because it had been sown in rainy weather. But there were 140 acres of arable altogether. Some of that must have been what was shown in Roke's map. And there was also a ruined dove house. So she would have been able, before it was ruined, to, to have doves um, and their eggs to eat. The first real hint of this as a farming estate. I'm afraid from there we have to leap to the 17th century and I've taken a detail from Roke's map. And um, the reason for the colouring is to show you that this was a series of terraces stepping down the hill. The apricot rectangle at the top, and they really are rectangles enclosed within walls, is the Palladian mansion and its outbuildings as it was in the 1740s. The next terrace um, is, a, is garden beyond this garden with lakes and then beyond that in pale green is the uh, is the pasture with, a, with an avenue and I think that the watercolour and um, Rachel is carefully using her mouse to steer you through if you come right to the bottom of that avenue Rachel that is the point where the gate was where the two men on horseback were looking up at the mansion on the hill and in the next picture, I've tried to annotate Roke's map so you can make a little more sense of how it worked. The farm associated with the estate is very hard to pin down, but I think it is the building across the lane at the very top of the image. And the road that runs along the top there is today's Pope's Lane, which is how you, the main entrance you, you'd come along to, to Gunnersbury Park. Um, I've labelled the terraces on the right, so you've got the mansion and the lodges at the top, you've got orchards on the middle terrace with um, square plats and a kitchen garden. The lower terrace seems to have flower gardens and topiary, little conical um, conifers and round topped trees. At the bottom you've got a right angle bend in the lane. And we believe that the lane that came from the top of this image beside the farm once ran straight across the estate. And when the, the Palladian estate was created, we think the road was diverted around it to give a particular position and the right views across the Thames. So if you imagine, instead of the road coming up and going right and then going north, if you imagine the road continuing roughly where the avenue is, um, that would um, seriously make possible um, a complete realignment of our vision of the estate. When the landscape was softened, um, those terraces disappeared into a soft slope. And there is just a possibility that Capability Brown was involved. The huge orchard of regularly placed trees became part of the parkland and at the top of it, Today, there is a Georgian temple and a round pond, and the kitchen garden that was lost from the terraces moved into the fields on the other side of the lane from Ealing to Kew. So it's a real change. It's very complicated. I don't expect you to remember it, but I need you to just understand that we went from the 1660s formal garden to the 1750s relaxed garden and site of a new kitchen garden. 
So um, let's have a look at how that estate looked. It's another of Payne's beautiful watercolours. The two parallel lakes, the canals, have been turned into the Horseshoe Pond, which is here in the foreground with a little pleasure boat. And you can see that there are sheep keeping the grass down on the lawn slope, which would undoubtedly have been food. <laughs> so they fit into this talk. Um, the next picture shows us the walled garden. Beside the round pond, um, a wall garden was created by Fernese, the um, MP who had taken over the estate in the 1740s. And Fernese's gateway through from the round pond into the wall garden had until recently this astonishing uh, carved wood gate. It has been taken away and put into store because the Cape Manor College, which occupies the wall garden today, had to start using this gate. Um, the gate from the other side of the garden um, gateway needed major repairs. So this is now a workable gate, but it is possible that this is in fact Fernese's gate. When the land was sold off um, after a few years after his death in 1762, there was some good description of um, his wall garden. It certainly had very um, elaborate provision for exotic fruit. And here are, um, I've just mentioned on the slide, melon frames and orange, citron and bergamot trees in tubs. And it is possible that rather like Chiswick House, the um, citrus trees were brought out in the summer and placed around the pond and the temple, but certainly they would have been taken into an orangery. And there is a later orangery, possibly on the site of, of the original one, but we don't know where Fernese's orangery for sheltering those trees actually stood. Now, the round pond was important, and that appears in the next slide, which shows another of Payne's watercolours. Um, this is the view from the temple, looking over the round pond. You will see that there are two men in the boat, hauling in a net. Uh, you can just see the floats on the top of the net um, in, in the middle of the picture. And we know that when um, Fernese's estate was being sold off, he was uh, selling off his, well, his um, executor was selling off carp, perch and tench um, from what they called the fishing pond. And I think this is definitely the round pond, not the smaller ornamental pond down the hill. But rather picturesquely, Payne has added a group of figures in the foreground. And it looks like a woman has brought a large bag with perhaps the lunch for the for the two gardeners um, who are resting on the, the, the steps of the temple. In uh, the picture, it's almost impossible to see, but just above the boat in the, the original watercolour, you can see there is a, a, a little shadow, a vertical line, just there. Thank you. Um, and for ages, people have been saying this is this is a view of the pagoda at Kew. But actually, I'm pretty sure that this is a very accurate picture showing you the enormous chimney of the very grand soap works by the river in Brentford. And so they weren't ashamed in their rustic view of putting in a bit of local industry. I think there are also a few black cows um, on the left grazing in a, a, a bit of the farmland. So we have fish and we have um, cattle um, that would provide food in the 18th century estate. Um, Fernese left enormously complicated debts and no proper will, and his sister had to try and sort out um, the estate. So we have information from the probate, but we also have information from other sources. Um, Kent, for example, wrote to Lord and Lady Burlington saying he was staying with Fernese and he stayed for a while. So he must have enjoyed, and um, he was there in two successive years. He must have enjoyed the hospitality of food from the estate, whether it was vegetables or meat. Um, and then we know that Handel stayed with Fernese. Fernese had, uh, was pretty obsessed with a, a particular opera singer. Um, and he also um, uh, called La Francesina, um, who sang for Handel. But he'd also paid in the 1730s and the 1740s to sponsor various Handel performances. And here the letter from the Earl of Radnor um, is disappointed 
as Handel is not going to take the waters when he was very overweight in the 1750s. And he'd gone to stay with Mr. Furness at Gunnersbury, and I fear eats too much of those things he ought to avoid. The things he might have needed to avoid could have included hams. Furness's um, merchant trading came out of Portugal, and in the probate papers there are two dozen hams from Malaga. So um, Handel and Kent may well have had um, rather Mediterranean food, um, rather than just the, the food from the estate. When the probate was finally sorted out, in 1762, Princess Amelia bought the estate and um, she used it primarily for very lavish entertainments. I'm not sure that you'll be able to decipher all of the news cutting on the left, but um, the um, King of Denmark came to stay the royal family weren't very fond of him and Amelia moved in and set up an enormous event to celebrate his arrival. Um, she provided a grand supper with a ball. There were foot guards ordered to attend while the king was there. And the entertainment included supper of 120 dishes for 300 of the nobility, a firework show, and then a ball which went on until three o'clock in the morning. So you can imagine this enormous Palladian house, the spectacular gardens sloping away to the south um, and, and, and the party going on. But her parties were not just on that scale. Lady Mary Cook's diaries include a lot of mentions of going to Gunnersbury. And this nice one in the summer of 1770, she mentions the, the princess suggesting dining in a building by the water. And I think that has to be um, the temple that we, we have today. Another view of the estate by Payne shows the ice house. This is looking along the south front of the mansion that you could see in one of my early slides looking up the hill. And there is a little pavilion sitting on a, a bump, which I'm pretty sure is the ice house to the 17th century house. In the distance, again, a very accurate picture um, but you can't quite see it on my slide, but just to the right of that little pavilion is the spire of the parish church in Acton. And they were showing um, that here is the estate, but it's sitting in a, in a, a landscape with, with a rural landscape with villages. And in the archway in the distance, um, there is a couple canoodling happily. Um, very small figures, but Payne likes to put figures into his pictures. Now here we're not looking at the cultivation of food, but we're looking at the very fashionable opportunity to use ice to make spectacular desserts by having an, an ice house. And when the estate was divided, a second ice house was installed and the bump for that is still there in the park, down the hill near to the present orangery. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, the, there was plentiful provision of ice at Gunnersbury and the ice would have been taken from one or other of the of the ponds that we know on the estate. After Amelia's death um, in 1787, the estate was sold off. It took a while to sell because the executors wanted a very large sum and the house had become very um, unfashionable. Um, it didn't have the whole of the estate that Fernese owns. A lot of that was leased out. Um, but in these cell particulars, which again, a bit too small for you to decipher, but I can see that there were plentiful fruit trees, a pinery for growing pineapples, a melon ground, hot houses, an ice house, a fish pond, which we've just seen both of. There was also a brew house and a bakehouse with a cool larder. And then at the very bottom, they describe fine old Japan, Dresden, Chelsea, Salopian and Oriental porcelain. So when the table was set for a dinner or for a banquet, um, there would have been really beautiful pottery from, uh, from uh, the, the guests to eat from. Um, after the, the um, estate was sold, there were a couple of owners who didn't stay very long I think they found it quite an expensive estate to maintain. But in 1800, when the estate was divided for development, new owners arrived. Um, on the left is a page from the land tax assessment. Fairly soon after the new houses had begun to be built, the assessors found it very hard to divide 
the separate estates and they were still showing it as being worth 270 pounds rather than dividing it amongst the individual owners. Um, but um, at the top of the manuscript, you can see Captain Raven. And we know that he bought the Temple and the Round Pond and the Wall Garden. He was a man who lived elsewhere in London. This was his country country cottage, really. Living in the temple wasn't a very big, a big house. But he let the Wall Garden to Samuel Pupa, a member of a rather important Huguenot um, gardening family. Um, he is followed in the list on the left by Alexander Copeland, a major building contractor who worked with the Hollands, um, architects and builders in central London. He had a lot of government contracts for building things like barracks. He was immensely wealthy and he had a big yard in Westminster. But this was his moment to build a country house for his wife and family, completed in 1802. This is the building that is now the museum at Gunnersbury, though it has been altered by the Rothschilds. He owned 42 acres of Meadow and Park, plus 20 acres of garden ground and the hothouse. And um, I think that must include another area of garden, not the wall garden that William Raven had. And he let the hothouse to James Stewart, who was already there when Copeland took over. Next door was Stephen Cosser, who built a house which is now today called the Small Mansion and is awaiting restoration. And down the hill from the Small Mansion, he had six acres of garden and pleasure ground. And he did invest quite a lot in his gardens, but he only lived for a few years before that was sold on. When Stuart left um, the 20 acres that he had in, in the estate, it became part of Alexander Copeland's parkland. It wasn't used for cultivation. And Copeland later took over Raven's property and the wall garden. Copeland was very ambitious. And although there had been 13 plots set out for development at Gunsbury, a poor Cosser was confined to the one in the, in the northeast corner. And Copeland really managed to buy up the rest of it um, and, and to lead a really rather um, pleasant and comfortable life. As you'll see in my next slide, where I can describe um, some of the things that he was doing. Um, in 1813, um, he and his gardeners installed cast iron cucumber frames, which sound very ambitious. But later, uh, sorry, but earlier that year, they had lost an enormous amount of glass in a hailstorm, uh, which must have hit the hot houses and the orangery and so on. And it may well be that that's why they were building a different set of, of cucumber frames. We're very fortunate that. Copeland's notebook survives in the Copeland family archive and we've been able to copy it and see what he was recording about his life there. Um, for example, he also extended the hothouse for his exotic fruits by 36 feet. This is a very substantial hothouse in 1825. And during the time he was there, he was inviting the neighbours at what we call the small mansion and uh, other neighbours in Ealing and Acton and Brentford and Little Ealing, including John Quincy Adams, the American who was uh, living here for a while uh, when he was representing the, the government. But he also had cricket parties and he, his son's wedding breakfast, which he describes as a déjeuner for 350 guests, cost him £800 in 1826. Um, when his property was sold off, there were a number of marquees and um, garden furniture and so on. So I think he must have been capable of setting up quite an ambitious um, party with his marquees in the park um, if he chose to do so. Now, when Copeland died, this was the point at which um, the Rothschilds bought the estate. Um, in 1835, there is the most wonderful sale catalogue, there are two catalogues, one of the house and its contents, the, the, the large mansion, and one of the gardens. And just this double page spread, um, these are long lists of orange trees in pots and tubs. Um, there's a shaddock, which is what we would call a pomelo today. Um, and then there are also camellias and fuchsias. And then on the right hand page, fruiting pines, young pines being forced, um, they've got pineapples and um, citrus plants, just so many to behold, it's unbelievable. And this is what the Rothschilds took over. 
Um, sadly, Nathan Mayer Rothschild died within about a year of them taking over Copeland's estate, but Hannah Rothschild had already begun planning a new orangery and uh, improvements to the walled garden. And in fact, it was Hannah who dealt with the purchase. A letter survives from the agents for the Copeland family, and the sale went through on confirmed in this letter, which was addressed to Hannah. Nathan May was still alive, but he was busy with his bank in the city. And Hannah Rothschild was this formidable woman who really um, upgraded the estate, invested in the estate, and put the Rothschilds on the map in London society. She was so proud of what she'd done that um, she commissioned a map from Kretschmar, who was a military surveyor. Um, and this appears in my next slide, just a little extract from it. The whole estate is in the is in the is in the plan and that you can find this on the Royal um, Collections website but you can just see here the round pond with the temple to the north of it and the mansion to the right um, but the walled garden is laid out spectacularly with um, all its um, beds of fruit and vegetables. In the middle is the enormous greenhouse which is not as we think of a greenhouse that is um, the, the, the hothouse. Uh, just to its left was the habitation for the gardener with a greenhouse behind. And then at the top, a hot bed for the pineapples and more long narrow beds for fruit and vegetables. Um, the the um, Rothschilds were so ambitious with what they grew for their parties. Um, and that when there was a wedding banquet for Leonora and her cousin Alphonse, which appears in the Illustrated London news picture, which follows, you can see the scale of what they were, what they were up to. This is the building um, which you see today. Um, this is the far western room on the ground floor of the large mansion. This picture only works if they had actually taken the windows, the huge French windows, out of their frames, and the artist would be standing in a marquee extension onto the terrace. Um, inside you can see people seated at tables, but I think they must also have used the adjoining long gallery and the um, lounge, which the sitting room, which was to the eastern end of the house, because it was an enormous event. And you can see the footmen um, attending and serving the, the guests, with the women with flowers in their hair and so on. Um, a very, very exciting event, which the Illustrated London News chose to chose to, to, to publish with an illustration. You couldn't run an estate like this without an army of servants, and here they come, 24 of them. Um, we don't know all of their names because they just aren't all recorded, obviously, in the house. A lot of the outbuildings had accommodation for servants, the lodges and the rooms above the stables, for example. I don't think you have any of the men who would have lived in the rooms above the stables here. These are the, the um, internal house domestic servants, really. But it's quite interesting. The man in the centre in the tweed suit must be some sort of steward. And the woman with the white lap dog, I think, is the housekeeper with the butler uh, on, on her left. Um, but there is a man in an apron who I think may be the butcher. Um, and there are servants in different kinds of garments. The men on the outside of the front row are probably the footmen, but the others would have been working in the, the, um, in the household. And most of the maids have got little white caps, um, would have been uh, looking after the house as well as serving the food and preparing the food. Um, in the early 1900s, you had to have licenses for servants, and there are some licenses that survive in the Rothschild archive, but not enough to identify all of the, the kitchen staff and the footmen. The ambitious horticulture continued, and we have this absolutely extraordinary photograph of mushrooms growing under the large mansion. And these are actually in the cellar of the Palladian house, which is still there underneath the mansion. Um, there's been a great scare about there being um, asbestos in the Victorian part of the cellars, and it's not gone back into use since the restoration of the house. But it would be wonderful to be able to take visitors into this 17th century part of the house. Um, but 
just to sort of have a sense of what the Rothschilds were, were doing with their estate, the gardener claimed to deliver 6,000 pots of strawberries every summer. Um, and these were sent up to their house in Piccadilly um, and to other Rothschild houses in Buckinghamshire, and also strawberries given as presents, um, just as the pineapples were as well. So uh, the a lovely um, picture of the mushroom spawn supplier, um, who very proudly, based in Brentford, and he puts down the fact that he's a fellow of the Royal Horticultural Society at the heading of his, of his um, invoice. And here he was supplying spawn in July and in September, one pound 10 shillings, more than a week's salary for a servant. This was an enormously ambitious investment in 1910. The Rothschilds stayed until the 1920s, but the loss of uh, the heir in the First World War and the fact that the other relatives were aging, London was growing and the A4, the Great West Road was being planned to the south of the estate. They were ready to sell off the land. Um, Ealing and Acton councils bought the estate. The park does not lie within their boundaries. It lies within Brentford but they did not want building on the sports fields as it is today. It was just, it was Brentford's common field. And they were convinced they could make this a viable estate for the public by charging for an awful lot of things like catering, sport and events. They even had an air show in the late 1920s on the field. But when they opened in 1926, um, Neville Chamberlain is there in the foreground um, making his speech and the men of the press are just on the very bottom left hand corner and there is a camera, um, a, a film was made, a little black camera on legs uh, with a number three, film was made which you can find online, <laughs> but at this time part of their business of earning an income to keep the estate going meant that the walled garden was leased out to a, a market gardener so it was still producing food and the owner of 500 sheep rented the fields for their grazing. So sheep were still in the park. It hadn't become a series of sports field right at the, the beginning of its transition into being, um, being a public park. Um, the farm buildings that the Rothschilds established became the changing rooms um, overlooking the um, Brentford Common Field. This land was acquired in the 1860s. It had not been part of the historic park and they used part of it as a polo field, but it must also have been part of their food production for their very lavish parties. It would have been a waste of the land not to do that. The field became a real resource in wartime. This fabulous aerial photograph taken by the RAF in 1944 shows you the estate um, the strangely denoted area in the middle is in fact the golf course which was opened in the park. The round pond is just above it and then on the left you can see really complex structures. Things that look a bit like spiders are in fact a series of gun emplacements with concrete roads leading to them. But the darkest patches with the pale outline of fencing are in fact um, they've become vegetable plots at the top that there's fields of cabbages huge field just behind the houses of Pope's Lane and then further down the left hand side rows and rows of something you can't tell if they're cabbages but there's it's certainly a field planted to create vegetables as part of dig for victory so Gunnersbury was doing its bit in the 1940s in the 50s the um, park management invested in the Pavilion Cafe. Um, hitherto, tea had been provided in the um, small mansion. It was run by the woman who also ran the cafe at Kew Gardens and at Battersea Park. And she offered both a rather grand dining room and um, tea and ices for the masses. The Friends took it over for three years in the 1980s. It almost killed us. It was so exhausting running this at the weekends when we were all had full time jobs. But we did have some staff and we developed a wonderful functions business in the 1980s, beginning to use the temple and the orangery for parties. Um, and it was very profitable. Um, we even had five chess freezers for our ice cream in the cafe. 
um, and the um, turnover by the end of the um, of the Friends business was forty two thousand a year, which was which was quite something, given that most of the sales were very small sums. Our manager took it over when we moved on, and we wrote a report for the council saying you must not let this be a greasy ski sorry a greasy spoon again we had washed the grease off the walls when we took over and it was disgusting but everything we did was homemade um steak pies enormous dixies of homemade minestrone homemade eclairs sausage rolls baked potatoes it was a very lovely cafe um, when we were running it our manager ran it for five years and then uh, went off with his Maltese girlfriend to run a hotel in Malta and the council let it to a greasy spoon. So it, it went downhill again. But when the park regeneration was underway, this was replaced with a brand new cafe, which you can see in the next picture, a, a rather more formal building um, run by Ben Ugo, like so many park cafes, um, and you can see from the interior, it was um, it was rather dignified um, in the next photograph. Um, it had a pizza oven and a bar and um, some people complained about the cost, but it was meant to be a viable business. Sadly, at the very beginning of the lockdowns uh, for COVID, um, it was set fire to and we lost the cafe and you can see the smouldering ruins in the next picture. Um, the fire brigade were there at one o'clock. A little extension to the cafe had housed the Rothschilds' carriages and the transport collection, and they actually hauled everything out at one o'clock at night um, and rescued. And, and it's only a little bit of scorching on the carriages. While the cafe has been missing, um, the park management have put a whole series of uh, pop up uh, food stalls in, and now building work has started again on a, a replacement cafe um, using the insurance money. Meanwhile, um, part of the restoration involved taking the walled garden of the small mansion down the hill near to the Horseshoe Pond. You can see work is still in progress here with the scaffolding on the wall, but the Capel Manor students have been involved in lots of ways and here they're mulching the vegetable beds in that walled garden. And the next picture will show you clearly the benefits of that because it has become a very successful vegetable garden um, with professional and volunteer gardeners working in that space. Today, you can book a function in the Rothschilds rooms. Um, the, the picture on the left has the most bizarre orange light in the cornice. We attended a friend's 70th birthday party there and um, the lighting included purple sort of almost like fountains shooting up the walls. I'm, I don't know quite what the designers thought they were doing, but this layout was used for um, a Rothschild uh, bank banquet. They have been back to have a dinner but you can also have smaller scale tables for weddings and so on. So the Rothschild rooms is what they're calling the three state rooms along the back of the um, large mansion. And you can also dine in the orangery, which is visible in the in the next slide. So Gunnersbury has gone from a farming estate through being a rather grand estate for wealthy owners, always being a productive place and now being a place where the production is modest, but you can go and eat. If you want to find out more, um, you can buy the history that James Wisdom and I have written. It's on sale on the Brentford and Chiswick Local History Society website or in the museum. And we've also written a piece about the transformation of the gardens because everybody kept saying that it was Amelia who turned the gardens into the softened landscape. And it's quite clear that it wasn't Amelia, it was Henry Fernese. So if you want to follow up, there's the website for the, um, the, the estate, um, if you would like to discover more. That's the end of my account. And I'm going to hand back now to Judith um, because there's a little detail here about volunteering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Val. That was absolutely fascinating I, I say that after every talk but every talk just amazes me how much there is to find out about uh, what are often you know fairly small patches of land but they're so rich with with life and and history now um 
Val gave you some of the some insight into the pleasures to be had in getting involved with Gunsbury, which is a you know a, a, a complex organisation with a lot going on. So if you'd like to become a volunteer, do visit the, the Visit Gunnersbury website and sign up as a volunteer or <coughs> donate. <laughs> yes. um, it's like pause there. And if you um, want to find out more about our amazing neighbourhood that we're so privileged to, to live in, do please attend more of our talks. Um, we're, we're only part of the way through. We have Fulham Palace, Boston Manor, Chiswick, and Pitsanger Manor still to come. Thank you so much.